Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Here's a cool fact. A crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Another cool fact, you can get short-term health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short-term insurance plans are designed for people who are between jobs, coming off their parents' plan, or turning a side hustle into a full-time gig. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage with access to a nationwide network of doctors and hospitals. Get more cool facts about United Healthcare short-term plans at uh1.com. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous to your contracts, they said, "What the f- are you talking about? You insane Hollywood ass." So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Think of all the sleep hacks you've ever heard. You could spend years trying them all, or you could instantly transform your sleep with Bowl and Branch. They make the softest, most breathable bedding you'll ever feel. And it's all 20% off. That's their best sale of the entire season. Millions of sleepers love their buttery soft sheets, airy blankets, cloud-like duvets, and so much more. And you can try all of them for 20% off with promo code BUTTERY20. So hurry to bowlandbranch.com today. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com. See site for details. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I'm just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I am here with Dr. Jan Eppingstall, an Australian counsellor with a PhD in hoarding. Jan, how are you? Mm, It's a very interesting question. I'm okay. I'm okay. Glad to hear it. Mm, I've been better, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm here. So that's great. So in a previous episode, we talked about three different kinds of therapy that are often used among people who hoard. We talked about CBT and we talked about EMDR and we talked about ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. And today we're going to do a deep dive into acceptance and commitment therapy, which I'm going to call ACT from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful and which is the type (laughs) of therapy you practice. So, First of all, can you explain a bit about ACT and how it works? Ah, you've opened that can of worms now, and I will I will explain it. I like to geek out a bit, so please, I hope people won't want to fast forward. ACT is, um, ACT promotes kind of accepting what is outside of your personal control and committing to action that improves and enriches your life. That's kind of in a nutshell. But to understand ACT and how it kind of works, there is a need to touch on the theory that underpins it. And I'll try and keep it concise, but it does help um, it does help to to make sense of some of the the parts of ACT. It's a bit geeky, but I do think it's helpful. I am all for geeky. You're all for geeky? Great. Awesome. The underlying theory on uh, which ACT is based attempts to explain the huge question of how the mind works. It's supported by extensive experimental research and is called relational frame theory or RFT. 
the purpose of studying relational frames was to discover the core features of human thinking. I just don't know. These people just stepping forward and asking these sorts of questions amazes me. But it emerged from researchers like Stephen Hayes, one of the creators of ACT, and he was asking the question, how might a conversation between a client and therapist lead to change in a client's life? Okay. Mind blown, pretty big question, but a functional one. It's a huge question. It's a huge question, but it's kind of like, wow, okay, so you want to ask that question. That's cutting straight to the chase. Um, But RFT is a language theory that began by looking at how verbal rules guide human behavior. And humans, like other animals, unlike other animals, can learn without direct experience. So a cat might touch a hot stove once and then learn it burns and never do it again. But language actually allows a human child to learn. So stove equals hot equals burn equals pain without actually experiencing that. And that sounds like we kind of go, yeah, well, that's just, okay, yeah, we know that. But this means that language offers humans a tool that allows us to create a world in our mind and we can ponder the past or anticipate the future. The outcome of this research was understanding the implications of um, humans' ability to think relationally. So we can arbitrarily relate anything to anything. So that's the foundation of spoken and written language. Our ability to use symbols, sounds or shapes or whatever, to represent anything makes us unique. We all kind of get that as well. But just to geek out a little, the word symbol comes from the ancient Greek root bowl, meaning to throw, combined with sim, meaning the same. So symbol literally means thrown as the same. So when our minds throw words at us, those words appear to be equivalent to the things they refer to. So C-A-T equals cat equals furry mammal with whiskers, claws, you know, that meows and likes fish and sits on my desk. (laughs) And is very pretty, I have seen. And is very pretty and pretty much ornamental. (laughs) Very cute, though. Um, So further geeking there, the word refer means literally carry something again. So fur meaning carry, re again. When we think, we arbitrarily relate events. So symbols carry back objects like thoughts, behaviours, events, etc. Because they're related to those events as being the same. Okay, yeah. You see what I mean? So this results in symbols entering this relational network in our mind. So, you know, when you think of or see something and then there's that cascade of related thoughts specific to you and your experience and it brings you to what seems like a totally unrelated thought. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like maybe books and then you end up at quicksand. And your friends are like, how did you get there? (laughs) Like, what what was the thought process there? That's your relational network. So relational frames are the different types of relationships we can make between things like coordination frames, same, similar, like, or temporal or causal frames like before, after, if, then. Okay. Comparative or evaluative stuff. Yeah. So better than, worse than, small, big, safe, sane, all those sorts of evaluative kind of words. Spatial frames, near and far, or the one I like the most, which I can't pronounce very well, is dietic frames, which is the I, you, here, there frame. And I know that Stephen Hayes goes on and on about that, and I find it very hard to understand, but I have to mention it there because he loves it. These relational frames are excellent in the concrete world because they help us problem solve. And without them, we'd still be up in the trees. The problem begins when we apply it to our inner world. And this is the essence of ACT. So when we apply our problem-solving mind inward, pain and suffering can occur. So what happens is our mind makes all these arbitrary relationships seem true and real, not arbitrary at all. So this then becomes like a verbal rule we follow. For example, like let's take something joyful and beautiful like a sunrise. Through these relational frames, this beautiful sunrise can actually cause pain for someone who's recently suffered a loss. 
Why? Because they feel happy briefly. Then their relational network is reminded that the opposite of happy is sad. (laughs) Then they're reminded of their loss. So a joyful moment can actually be related to a painful moment in a flash. You know, like you see that happen to people, they'll be like, oh, this is so gorgeous. And then you'll see them, I can't be happy because I've lost this person or I've lost this thing or whatever. So in summary, relational frames are learned and applied arbitrarily. There's no way to control the process so that unhelpful relations are not kind of derived. We can't stop children from deriving that they're not as lovable or as intelligent as they might actually be. It's not something us as parents can do. It can happen without, we can't, we just can't stop that. So, and there's no process called unlearning and this is core to to act as well. So once you know, this thought is derived, this type of thought is derived, like I'm unintelligent, it can't be erased. It will always be there underlying. So its effect can be diminished to close to zero by, you know, doing various things, but it can be relearned super easily, like in a flash. It might be, you know, a decade on, but it might still pop up. And our memory means it's impossible to restructure our cognitions. So that's one of the things that differs with ACT and with classic CBT because ACT is a type of cognitive behavioural therapy. But it really is that, you know, um, the idea that we can restructure our thoughts. They come and they're there and they're not something that we can unlearn. We can't all of a sudden not think, oh, I'm unintelligent. It will always be underlying. So you can think deeply, I am unintelligent. And then you can do a lot of work and improve your confidence and prove to yourself that you can learn or that you are clever. And then that one thing you don't understand can take you right back to, oh, there we are. I'm unintelligent. Exactly. I have a PhD. I have a master of counselling. I have that's my that's my story. You're unintelligent. Yeah. You're not as you know. You're not as smart as the others. You're not as you know. And that came from someone saying that to me. And I was grow. I was a grown woman when they said it to me. But I took it. I I'd already had. I always had it a little bit. And then that was just like the icing on the cake. And as you say, something you know, that I don't get, I'm back there. I'm like, well, you're not very smart. And it's so quick. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to sort of have a bit of a, well, I'm having the thought that I'm not smart. <laughs> Toodaloo, <laughs> get on with what I'm doing. Yeah. But it is, it's, you're, you're right back there in that instant. Yeah. So that is kind of the backbone of ACT. Um, And then all these other things kind of fit into that. And it's based on this sort of relational frame theory uh, of language and the mind and cognition. Wow. So I read a lot about ACT when kind of planning this episode. And one of the things I read was that ACT doesn't aim to reduce symptoms, but that symptoms often do reduce despite that when people have the therapy. So two-part question, A, why is symptom reduction not a goal of ACT? And B, what would be classed as symptoms when talking about hoarding disorder? Mm. So first of all, within ACT and most sort of therapies, there's no negative or positive emotions. So often clients come to therapy to get rid of some psychological pain that's stopping them from leading a fulfilling life. And this isn't a goal of ACT because per ACT's underpinning theory, it doesn't work. So in the simplest of terms, we get what we focus on. So if we can sort of unpack that a bit, if our clothes are dirty, we wash them. If our floor is muddy, we mop it. The thing we don't want or like is gone through our actions. If we use this kind of problem-solving strategy for psychological problems, we might think, oh, this is something I don't like or want, you know, anxiety, depression, obsessive thoughts. So the answer is to get rid of them. Problem solved. 
bish bash bosh they're gone unfortunately as i said before thoughts and our internal world don't work in the same way as our in our concrete environment and this is because of that complex relational network our mind creates so <laughs> all, these are always fun these little kind of experiments that we can do with our mind but um in order to not think about something we have to create a verbal rule don't think about x <laughs> so the rule contains x and tends to evoke x so we're reminded of x every time we try not to think of x don't think of a pink elephant oh my god how come you you just Oh, you've thrown me because that's what I've used as an example. It's Jesus. always the example. I don't know why, but it always is. But it's effective because you, I, and all listeners are now think, yeah, pink elephant. Exactly. <laughs> so research has found that we might be able to not think about X for a short while, but it soon appears more often than ever. So attempting to not think about it makes you think about it even more and then it becomes central to your thinking and I mean on a very basic level I have many years of experience of panic attacks and I know that the worst thing I can do is go it's just push it down yeah <laughs> because it forces it's like what's that game where you hit one and three other things pop up it's um you can't like the other day I felt the beginnings of a panic attack and instead of going, no, 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 I can't shush, I just, I actually said to myself, said to the panic, okay, I see you there. I'm really busy at the minute, so I can't look at you directly, but like I'm acknowledging you're there and I'll come back to you in a bit kind of thing. And it just... Genius. Absolutely genius. Yeah. And it, it was okay because it was, it wasn't feeling it had to force its way forward to be seen. Exactly. And so then when I had the, a chance to breathe, I was able to go, okay, right, what's actually going on? And, you know, what are you stressed? Okay, I'm stressed about this. Okay, let's um, let's deal with that. But um, I, this, I spent so many years just suppressing that mm. kind of thing. And it doesn't work. It either reappears as the same thing stronger or as a different thing. Exactly. But it, it's there, yeah. It's there and often it is way stronger and it becomes kind of so central that you're constantly trying to push it down. You know, you push it down and it pops up somewhere else. As you say, I can't think of what that is called. Yeah. It's not that. Yeah, no, I can't yeah. think of the game. I can't either. <laughs> I want to call it like whack-a-mole. Oh, it could be, but yeah. It could be whack-a-mole. Yeah, it's kind of like that, though. Yeah. That's exactly it. But what you did there is exactly what an ACT kind of therapist would recommend because you've gone and you've you've acknowledged that it's there and you've gone hey I see you but got shit to do yeah I'll be back which is really exactly what they would suggest you know the other thing is when you're trying not to think about something you keep checking in to see if you're not thinking about it <laughs> am I thinking about it it's so funny it's so funny and then, and then the problem's worse than when you started. So, you know, the, and, and with the pink elephant example, you can try it yourself. How many times have you thought about a pink elephant in the last few days? Well, once because you mentioned it and twice because I wrote about it. <laughs> <laughs> then time yourself for about five minutes and try as hard as you can not to think of a pink elephant. How many times do you think? However fleetingly about that pink elephant. And then if you can flip that and spend the next five minutes thinking whatever thoughts come into your mind, how many times do you think of it? Probably about the same and it will remain the same. So the goal is not to reduce symptoms because it doesn't tend to work, especially with thought disorders. Yeah. Um, at really just the suppressing of things, as you as you suggested with a panic attack or um, or any other sort of oh you know my worthlessness or my hopelessness etc. If we if we get what we focus on, um, and that is definitely something that's kind of the backbone of of act. 
in terms of what would be classed as symptoms when talking about hoarding, anxiety about letting go of something that when we might think is useful or valuable or important is kind of the central symptom. So in essence, hoarding disorders and anxiety related disorder, people who hoard want to remove that anxiety with thoughts like I'm I must get rid of this overwhelm and anxiety. And then they think of ways they can do it, problem solve it. And they'll think something like, oh, if I throw this away, then I won't be able to tolerate the loss of the object. Uh, What can I do to tolerate the distress? The answer comes, save it, keep it. And the anxiety drops quickly in the moment. And so you go, there's the solution for everything. (laughs) Exactly. And that's actually an exp- experiential avoidance. That is that is a, um, an example of experiential avoidance, which, which we're coming on to in a bit. Yeah. Mm, mm. So that is why it doesn't aim to reduce symptoms. It's more about, yeah, it's, it, it's they will reduce, like the, the idea is that We will never promise as a therapist that they will reduce. And even when you use some sort of a uh, a measure to see how much the person's improved, you're not looking for reduction in anxiety, reduction in depression symptoms. We're looking at how are you able to manage those things when they come up like yourself like okay. I would give you five stars I'd be saying right you, you the, the level of anxiety was still there but the way you handled it was five stars that was exactly you know and that and, and you've now seen that that works yeah I was like ah oh, okay it's not it doesn't own me now I can talk to it. I can have a, you know, I can have a bit of a conversation and let it know that I can't, I can't, I can't do that right now. I haven't forgotten about you. Yeah. <laughs> I will come back. Yeah. Many years ago, I worked for a while in uh, mental health services and worked with a group for people who hear voices and mm. they were doing what was then quite radical and is now a bit more mainstream which was moving away from the traditional psychiatric view of voices as something to be managed into a view where voices have something to tell you. And so rather than medicating them away, it was more about, okay, see, you know, see what's going on. What are they saying? Who does that represent? All of that kind of stuff. And it was really at the time a growing movement that is now got a bit more acceptance. But one of the strategies that they used to recommend if if your voices were particularly bad was to say okay I like you've got a lot to tell me but just not right now can we schedule this in for later kind of thing and um and yeah things would calm down and then a few hours later they could say okay let's have that chat now or whatever and um and when they felt more equipped to deal with it that's amazing and that an act has been Six, you know, they've successfully trialed it with things, you know, things like schizophrenia, particularly as you say, the vo- the voices, yeah. and accept, you know, as you say, accepting that it's there, yeah, recognizing it's there, and you know, even turning towards it, which is something that, um, you know, which is something that we often don't want to do. We don't yeah. want to turn around and face it. Especially because the thing with, I, I found this whole movement fascinating, which is why I know a fair bit about it now. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, was that psychiatry didn't want people to listen to the voices, but also the people who, people who hear voices, if they are fine, if they are friendly voices or useful voices, they don't seek help because it's mm. fine and so some people hear voices and say oh wow that's jesus and are happy some mm. people hear voices and say oh wow i'm a psychic and are happy and some people hear voices that are awful and seek help so mm. the only people seeking help are the people with negative voices first of all um most you know in the vast majority of cases but these are people who, of course, didn't want to hear what their abusive, horrible voices were saying, but mm. had tried 
in vain to push them away for many years and it just wasn't happening. Mm. And instead turning around, like you say, and kind of saying, okay, what, what are you trying to tell me? Mm. Takes the power away. Takes the power. And it just reminds me of any horror, any horror film or, you know, anything like that suspenseful show. Yeah. <laughs> Until you actually see it, it's so damn scary. And then as soon as you see it, you go, oh, God, oh, he's going to be able to kill that. No probs. Yeah. Or is the killer behind that door? I don't know. Is the killer behind that door? Once you know where the killer is, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. Exactly. <laughs> and it's funny because that's um, that was Stephen Hayes, who's one of the, the key um, developers of ACT. He's... Um, He's done a TED talk and a few other things around his panic, his severe panic attacks, and that's what brought him to this space. And he talks about that time when he's just on the floor in his bedroom, just thinking he's going to die. <laughs> and he's like, "No, I'm turning around and I'm going to look at you." <laughs> and that was kind of the start of his sort of research around it, thinking, "Hang on a minute, if we, you know, if it loses its power." And I take my power back. That is the process that he's kind of worked on for the past whew, 40 years at least, probably longer. Um, and that's kind of set, that's essentially uh, what ACT is about. I will find that TED Talk and put it in the show notes. Yeah, do. It's really good. It's worth the, It's worth the time because he's just, yeah, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a fangirl, but yeah, I do. I do like Steve Hayes. <laughs> He'd be in his seventies by now. He's, ah. he's not not young now, but yeah, he's still he's still prolifically working. Good. So, reading about acts, I kept coming across the terms psychological flexibility and psychological inflexibility, and the act is thought to be best suited to conditions where psychological inflexibility is a big issue. So I read psychological inflexibility and interpreted it as stubbornness. Um, is that a fair summary? <laughs> and also is, I think the answer to this will be yes on instinct, <laughs> but is psychological inflexibility common in hoarding disorder? <laughs> I love that, that it's <laughs> that you see it as stubbornness. Sort of, but it's a bit more complicated than that. It kind of is, yes. Kind of is. Um, Steve Hayes and his his colleagues define psychological flexibility as being in contact with the present moment fully. So there's your mindfulness piece as a conscious human being without unnecessary defence and persisting with behavioural change um, according to your values. So he developed, him and his colleagues developed um, the psychological flexibility model. And this model can describe both psychological health and the opposite, psychopath psychopathology. They called it, embarrassingly, the hexaflex. He didn't really want that to stick, but it did. So he's just, oh, he rolls his eyes every time he says it. But there are six processes that contribute to flexibility or inflexibility. And these six processes can be further grouped into these three specific response styles. So the first is open of flexibility, acceptance and diffusion. Then we have centered, which is being in the present moment and something called self as context. Don't ask me about that. <laughs> uh, we could be here for a lifetime. Then the third... <laughs> It's not really that hard, but it, it, it makes things a bit complicated. Then the third response style is being engaged with your values and committed action. So it's kind, it's this hexagonal model with these three kind of response styles. And it might sound like a whole bunch of BS, but the idea is that when you are flexible psychologically, you're able to be open and willing to experience thoughts and feelings without getting hooked by them. And believing them to be true, which is what hooks a lot of us. We we have these thoughts and feelings and we think, yep, that means this is the truth. I'm, you know, I'm unworthy. Why am I even bothering? No, it's a thought. It's not the truth. 
and we need to, it, the idea is to be able to be in that present moment, not worrying about the future or ruminating over, over the past. And you're able to then take action towards the values that you've chosen for yourself, not those ones that you think you should be working towards, but the ones that you've freely chosen. And then the opposite of these six processes is, ex is experiential avoidance and cognitive fusion. Those are the closed kind of um, inflexible ways of approaching things. And then inflexible attention and attachment to the conceptualized self. Now, those two things are really about ruminating and being in the past or worrying about the future. Attachment to the conceptualized self is about the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. You know, those little stories are, ah, this is the type of person I am. These are the ways I do things. Um, and that, I guess, could be seen in that stubbornness kind of um, stubbornness position because you're really not willing to look at yourself in a different way from a different angle. It's just, this is my story. And then in terms of being engaged, we can have values, but they might not be values that we've chosen freely that are really deeply held by us. So they might be fused or avoidant values is what he actually, what Steve and uh, his colleagues call them, which kind of means, for example, with hoarding, it might be, I have a value of scrupulosity or I don't want to waste. And it's just that rigidness to that that then impacts all the other parts of our life. So that he would call a fused or pliant value. Um, and then in terms of actions, you know, it's just sitting around doing nothing or being very impulsive um, is another way we can, you know, be inflexible regarding our actions. So in my research, I did find that people reporting clinical levels of hoarding behaviour were more inflexible overall, but specifically experiential avoidance and that cognitive fusion piece were the most significant. <laughs> Additionally, there was some issues around present being present in the moment. Some ways in part of their mind, in some of the mindfulness measures, I found that uh, people with hoarding um, tendencies were more focused and that seemed to be on things like, you know, the individual nature of things and that, you know, recognising the colour and the beauty and all that kind of stuff was very strong and a lot of other areas it was a lot weaker. So um, I thought that was quite interesting. But experiential avoidance and cognitive fusion, being sort of hooked by our thoughts and believing them um, and that wanting to avoid any negative internal experiences were particularly high for the group that I um that I surveyed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. One study I read, and I'm going to link to all of these studies in the show notes at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk in case you too want to geek out on therapy theory. Want flexibility? Take yoga. Want flexibility with your health insurance? Check out United Healthcare Insurance Plans. Underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, they offer flexible, budget friendly medical, dental, and vision coverage that may be right for you. More at uh1.com. Hey there, it's Michelle Norris. I'm host of a podcast called Your Mama's Kitchen. When I travel, I'm usually looking for a way to find a taste of home when I'm not at home. And one of the things I love to do when I am at home is entertain. And Airbnb allows me to do that. When I was in California recently, I rented a house that had a great kitchen. And when we were sitting around the table, we we're all thinking, we're in someone else's house. Someone could be in all of our homes as well. If you have a home, but you're not always at home, you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. But one study said, ACT is aimed at improving the components of a client's life that are deemed to be important by that particular client. Does that mean it's harder to use ACT if somebody is not keen on change? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Often clients come to see a therapist with the hope, as I said earlier, of getting rid of something, anxiety, depression. So they want this to change. So that is really important to them. 
And that means you can still work with them. I know that it's definitely been used with um, treatment reluctant clients or treatment refusers because it's focused on the individual in their context. What is the problem as they see it? So that means, you know, for a hoarding client, um, my problem is that the council won't get off my back and leave me alone. You know, if we were to use CBT and we were go to go down that cognitive reappraisal approach, we might want to try and convince them that, you know... <laughs> That's not the real issue or... <laughs> yeah, that's not the real issue. That, you know, um, needing to save is irrational and let's try and change that. It's unlikely to work. But if we approach it saying, okay, well, what can, what can we do in order to get them off your back? What are the things that we can achieve? You know, that is the sort of angle rather than attempting to change the person's, um, you know, change those thoughts, which just really doesn't work, especially if there's a traumatic kind of um, background as well, because there's the slipping in and out of, you know, fight, flight, or down into, um, you know, a freeze or um, flop, you know, we can't get those people up and down out of those. So I think that's, I think it definitely can be used. It's about how you, yeah, how you get it, how you go about finding out how they perceive the problem, to, you know, what they perceive the problem to be. And that always makes, makes for better therapy when you're looking at it from that person's perspective. Yeah, makes sense. And I think that's connected to values as well, which is something you've mm. talked a lot about before. What are values in ACT and how are they relevant with hoarding? Yeah, look, values in ACT are kind of considered, as I said before, flexible psychologically when they're freely chosen. So they're not forced on us by duty or society. Um, and it was interesting when I, a few years ago, I think it was in 2018, I did a did my own values investigation. You know, I went through the process of going through the lists of words and looking at all of those things and saying to myself, you know, what really do I value? And the things that I found that I thought I should value, you know, orderliness and punctuality and all of these things, and I just really quizzed myself and I said, is that really what you value? Do you really value those things? I don't know that you do. You do because that's what society or what your family expects from you. So then everything kind of, a lot more stuff fell away. And I, I kind of came around to that sort of curiosity, courage and flexibility, being able to bend with the wind rather than snap. Those are the things that came out overall but then I had different ones in different areas of my life and that's the other thing there's not just five that rule the world you know it's not like the <laughs> rings of power <laughs> you know it's kind of more than that um, but many of us do need to clarify our values and they're not a thing like a goal you know that can be achieved and moved on from they're that directionality that pulls us towards acting in a way that's meaningful to us but yeah, you know, many of us are aimlessly moving through life, kind of feeling a bit empty and unmotivated. It's the classic midlife crisis. You know, I have everything I ever wanted, but I'm still unhappy. That's kind of the thing about values. You know, that is recommended for, for everyone because freely chosen, they are our guide. They will guide us. And there's really no bad value. You know, there's nothing that's necessarily bad. It just it just depends on on the direction you want to take yourself. Um, and that values work does distinguish ACT from other CBT type um, therapies because it's only in the context of values that action and then acceptance and, and diffusion kind of come together and that psychological flexibility can take take place. So values is really core. And I often, usually I start with that um, with people and give them a chance to sort of think about some of these things, ponder it, you know, Google, what what does that really mean? Do I really know what that word means? Yeah. Is that something that's really important to me? It's not going to be easy and it might not necessarily be one and done. We might kind of, as I say, I look back on the ones I did, you know, maybe five, six, seven years ago, and they were quite different. 
But I think as you age, you kind of know more about yourself, you learn more. But I really do think with hoarding, that can be one of the things people are very, they're going through the, there's a lot of going through the motions, you know, there's a lot of just, I'm just existing, you know, and I also occasionally get the comment that, uh, I feel I'm too scared to dream, I'm too scared to want something because it might not come, you know, might come, might not come to me. I might not yeah. be able to to get that. And that again is where you're just going to softly, slowly move towards, you know, hey, let's just talk about some of these things. And if we can get some sort of a framework for the values that really drive or or could potentially drive them, it just helps things flow. And it means you can work better with that person because you know what's pushing the, you know, which things are really important it just it it makes a lot of sense to me um and there is a there is values they do have a section for values work in the buried in treasures hoarding um self-help book which is um they kind of relate it to motivational interviewing as a therapist i would put that first they tend to put it later on down the track when maybe motivation wanes or whatever. But I think if you put it up front, it's the engine that's going to drive the change. Yeah. So experiential avoidance has come up a couple of times. Mm. What is it? How does that work? Yeah. So for people who hoard experiential avoidance, which is the opposite of acceptance, is the most kind of relevant process. This is the avoidance of all internal experiences that the person considers negative. So it's also avoiding all circumstances that might expose a person to anxiety. And it's that emotion regulation strategy and that's central to hoarding. Now, that whole avoiding circumstances is one of the things that reduces and limits our life. So it closes us down and we keep, you know, we, we have less and less and less contact and it just makes the anxiety more and more stronger, you know, because you're there, you, you're not interacting with other people. But once we start avoiding circumstances, situations that might expose us to anxiety, then we are we are shutting ourselves down. And that is something that, you know, ACT talks extensively about saying, you know, that it's hilarious because um, <laughs> Steve Hayes, Sometimes, sometimes he's quite verbose and difficult to understand, and his is repertoire narrowing is what he calls that. It's that you're narrowing down on everything that you do, and you you know you're getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, and there's nothing else. You know, there's n- nowhere else to go because, as I explained earlier, that relational network. You know, maybe the original trauma happened at the supermarket, but then it expands to any shopping centre. Then it expands. You know, you know what I mean? And so you reduce back, 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 but you can never reduce enough. Yeah, I've talked on a previous episode about somebody I know who got stuck in a lift and got trapped in this lift and so avoided that lift from then on. Mm. But then she she was in a different lift in the same building and it kind of jolted and this is elevators for the Americans. And so then she was like, okay, I just won't use lifts in that building. And then she was getting anxious in all lifts. And so avoiding all lifts. And then it was kind of small spaces. And, you know, it came from getting trapped in a lift once mm. that it became almost claustrophobia by, you know, by a process of narrowing yeah absolutely. narrowing yeah I do love that repertoire narrowing I kind of think it's sort of got yeah. a bit of swagger to it but exactly that's an exact exactly what I mean um in terms of really shrinking down your life like your life just shrinks but not attempting to discard anything like remaining at home not inviting anyone in numbing out watching telly scrolling through social media playing solitaire on your phone. I mean, these are ways that people who hoard avoid feeling those anxieties. Often um, these are ways that people who hoard avoid feeling the anxiety that rises up when they even think about discarding. You know, you even ponder it. You're sitting there and you're going, hmm, okay, I'll have a look. Oh, no. Scroll, 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 or, you know. Um, So that's what experiential avoidance is about. And that's, 
you know, and that's very, very central. Avoidance is very central to hoarding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet we avoid one kind of pain by building in another kind of pain that's just different. It's not like we are avoiding all suffering by not throwing away. We avoid one kind of suffering by not throwing away and create other kinds at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. It's that whole, it is that whack-a-mole. I push it down here. I avoid it here, but it pops up there. And that again is why, you know, I think struggling and pushing things down, struggling to eliminate all of these thoughts from our minds, just, it doesn't work. So a guy called Russell Harris, who I think was a doctor, if I remember rightly, that that through act, Clients learn to stop fighting with their private experiences, to open up to them, make room for them and allow them to come and go without a struggle. The time, energy and money that they wasted previously on trying to control how they feel is then invested in taking effective action guided by their values to change their life for the better. Now, this does sound terrifying. Um, (laughs) Stopping fighting my difficult feelings what, how do I not fight? You know, I feel like fighting my difficult feelings is such a protective thing, even if yep. it's maladaptive. How does mm. that not be terrifying? Yeah. And I think it's that whole um, turning towards it and exposing <laughs> the boogeyman, you know, like that I think is what the idea is that we can stop fighting. It's like being in quicksand. You know, the more you struggle, the more likely you are to sink. Whereas if you just steady and recognize what's happening, you can kind of make, I guess, room for them. You know, it's that very much that curiosity that I bang on about, like looking at our thoughts rather than from them, allowing them to be there and acknowledge them. Like, thanks, mind. My mind's called Gloria. Gloria, thanks for telling me I suck, but I'm still going to start an acapella group. Too bad. You know, that sort of stuff is making room. That's what that's about. Yeah, that makes sense. And it doesn't, I guess you don't have to jump in with both feet and go, bring it on. You can be tentative and do it gently and carefully. It doesn't have to mean facing all your demons in one go, does it? No, not at all. So I struggle a bit with the acceptance side of acceptance and commitment therapy on the basis that accepting, I fully don't, don't fully understand it. Mm. Um, what if something is just unacceptable and could accepting things as they are lead us to actually resist change? I accept that I live in a hoarded house. I accept that, you know, I can't have my friends over, whatever it is. Mm. I think the thing that always um, confuses people about this, the idea of acceptance, um, it's more like willingness. So it's not resignation or tolerance. It's this willingness. So to be willing and accepting, you're adopting kind of like a gentle, loving posture towards yourself, more like self-compassion. So it's the opposite of trying to control thoughts and experiences that are actually uncontrollable. There's kind of that suggestion that to be willing and accepting means kind of a metaphor of noticing that you're the sky, not the clouds, the ocean, you're the ocean, not the waves. You know, you're, it means noticing that you're large enough to contain all of your experiences. And so unwillingness to have anxiety then predicts anxiety because you just, you know, as before with our pink elephant, if we're unwilling, that means we're pushing it away. I think acceptance is just the way we we think of it and how we use the word generally. But it's, it is, it's more, if you think about, about it more as a willingness, you know, I'm willing to live in a chaotic home or I'm unwilling, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it then gives you that different differentiation that kind of makes you look at it in a different way. But yes, there are some things that are unacceptable. And I think that ACT would just would have us be more willing and adapt that gentle posture about um, ourselves being more self-compassionate 
and allowing ourselves to notice, you know, that we're bigger than that. We're more than that. Yeah, that makes sense. Because something I'm increasingly aware of in myself is that I live in this way and my brain thinks it's normal. I don't Mm. look at things and think that has to change. I just think, Mm. oh yeah, in order to go into that room, I have to climb over that box or in order, I don't think of it even as something changeable. I just think Mm. that's how my house is. Um, Mm. I have nowhere to put my bag because there's stuff where I would put my bag. And it takes a while for me to go, oh, I could move the stuff because it's all just almost too accepted in my Mm. brain. And I guess that's where my hesitation was. Yes, with that with that word. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just happy to accept that this is. Yeah, my circumstances. It's more around that piece of whether you can control it or not, I think is really the, you know, the core of it. Because accepting the thoughts that come and go, knowing that we can't change them as such is part of it too. Accepting that they'll come, they'll go. I don't have to follow those thoughts. They're just words that have uh, strung together in my mind. They don't actually control me. Yeah, and that also rules out the kind of other fear that I guess I had about it around what if somebody's mistreating you or, you know, something. Do I accept my circumstances passively when, Mm. you know, that may be unacceptable? But again, from what you said, it's clearly a, a different realm. Yeah, yeah. And that ho- and that is one of the things that um, often comes up, you know, when you're working, w- when you're learning or you're teaching people around ACT and there's that. But what if the person's, you know, in this situation, in that situation? And look, that's another whole, that's another whole gamut because a person can be working on, working on their psychological flexibility, but it may mean that they are not accepting of the relationship that they're in or in the circumstances that they're in. And they're taking action as much as they possibly can in order to live to in the direction of their values. But, you know, that might mean there's all these steps in between because, you know, they need to escape, you know, from uh, an abusive relationship or maybe they need to, I don't know, change jobs to earn enough money to move state or, you know, all of those kinds of things are, um, yeah, they're kind of more the problem-solving stuff that you need to do that you can (laughs) problem-solve, whereas anything that's kind of like a thought or a feeling or emotion, all that sort of stuff is, is, is not... Um, suited for problem solving as such. Yeah, makes complete sense. So a study was done into an online self-help program where Mm. people who hoard can use ACT techniques on themselves. Now, it was, it showed kind of reasonable success from what I read, but I'm pretty sceptical, if I'm honest, about how, how this would compare to working with a therapist. Yeah. Um, this is Jennifer Craft's stuff, isn't it? She's a, um, uh, yeah, she's a um, sort of a fellow uh, traveller in this space. And I contacted her when she completed this for her PhD uh, thesis because I did mine around ACT and she's the only other person I know who's done it around ACT and we had a bit of a chit chat. I think, you know what, I think if you are an individual who's motivated for change and you're um, able to kind of sit and absorb this information through that kind of online situation, do it. You know, I don't think it's, you know, it's it's certainly not going to be um, detrimental. However, what I said to Jennifer was, I said, look, I'm working with lots of people who, you know, have a great deal of trauma in their background. And that is where we need, you know, the one-on-one support. Because without that kind of connection with the therapist, you know, the positive regard, all of that kind of thing of being in the room with someone, even just being on Zoom one-on-one with a person is that step better, you know. So I think, look, it's better than nothing and you probably could learn a few, you know, great ways to manage things and it's it's worthwhile. But I just think it's a whole nother level for people who 
you know, who have um, a significant trauma background. And that's what I was saying to her, like, hey, what, how are you managing that? I'm seeing this. What are you seeing? Um, and for her, that wasn't that wasn't evident. So, yeah, I think it's worthwhile. However, it is not probably the best option. I mean, the best option, the best option is therapy and then having someone assist you in the home for, you know, that that's that, that's basically what the research says. And that's what my experience suggests is that there needs to be that, you know, trust and that connection with a person who comes into your home that you accept as someone who's, you know, you know, someone who can help you. And then it's actually moving through and learning how to make decisions and listening to what your thoughts are, saying things aloud, just thought listing like mad, just I'm thinking this, dit, dit, dit. that's what really works. Um, but that's not, that's not a, a, you know, accessible for everybody. I wish it was. I wish it was. That's exactly what I was going to say. Not everybody has the money for help. Or even if they do, not everybody has access to somebody mm. with with specialism or with even knowledge of the, you know, never mm. mind specialism. I know. And so, yeah, and so online kind of things can be a stopgap or they can be, or, you know, as you say, for some people, I think if it's a kind of reasonably simple, like there's not too much co-occurring, maybe... Mm. I hesitate. I don't think it's ever simple, but you know what I mean? Simple as in, as opposed to multiple things at once going on. Yeah, I know what you mean, as in, exactly. And I just think that the whole, um, I think the other thing it could be good for is for people who are kind of tentative about therapy or that they're not quite sure, am I really a hoarder or is this really, you know, is this really right for me? It's that no... Um, risk kind of way of engaging, which I think is, you know, is quite good. Um, And in a way, that's something I've been thinking about for a while, you know, should I be developing something that is no, you know, like a no contact from me, just a very much a, you know, (laughs) and they can just kind of go and see, see if that is something that would help them. And then they can go off and find specialist treatment if there are people out there who can help them, you know. And also I'm wondering if somebody has had a course of therapy and found it really useful and then a year or two down the line feels like they need a top-up, maybe mm. that kind of online hands-off could mm. could be enough when you've already done the work. Yeah, that's right. And like almost like a maintenance kind of, hey, look, yeah, this is probably what's happened, you know, because it, it really, it happens to all of us. We, we need reminders, yeah. Slips, isn't there? We slip back and we kind of go, oh, I forgot about those things that I used to do and they really worked. I do think that engaging in therapy in that way, there's a lot of people have a little bit of a a mindset that it's, weekly I'm going to go and see my therapist and we're going to talk about my childhood and we're going to sit you know I'm going to lie back you know so Freudian and really it's not like that and it doesn't need to be like that for a lot of people even it you know I have clients who come to me when they you know they have a you know a problem or something they want to discuss something that's just perplexing them, you know, I can't get around this situation. <laughs> and I think that if if they know that they've got someone that, you know, a compassionate person to talk to about these things who understands, often I'll say, oh, so you mean blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> you know, just having someone who doesn't look at you like, what? <laughs> Is <laughs> that's just you know a tiny step towards feeling understood and feeling seen, and that's what people want. You know, people want to feel seen and understood, and that's another thing that um, a lot of the researchers these days are. There's this whole new area of therapy, which it's not really new, but the idea is what they're calling process-based therapy. And this is coming back to that question of what treatment by whom is most effective for this individual with this specific problem (laughs) under these circumstances, you know. And so the CBT theorists and the ACT and mindfulness-based theorists are coming together and created what they're calling process-based therapy. And it's not a new method. It's just a way of taking all of the 
core change processes that have been researched and then applying that to the individual and looking at the functional analysis of well, where, which parts of this person's life and cognitions and, and things are impacted and where are where are those loops that you know the, the never ending loops of things that are just constantly reinforcing one another and i think that is going to be the next place Big we go thing. because yeah look it's just so exciting and i do um i do use these these functional analysis kind of maps and i found them super helpful because it means i can ask you know questions around all these areas and come up with kind of like a this is feeding into this and then <laughs> this is happening and it almost gives the person a bird's eye view of what's going on and I do think that that works quite nicely. That sounds like the formulation we did in CBT mm. where kind of we started with an initial chart this when I do this or think this it leads to this which leads to this and then over the course of doing it, added to it as as mm. things came up. And then at some point later, if I was stuck, she would bring up the formulation and we would say, okay, which bit am I in now? Where, where... Mm, Exactly. I mean, when you've got Steve, uh, you've got Stefan Hoffman, who's a, you know, old school CPT, CBT man, you know, him and Steve Hayes used to be at each other's, you know, dueling in peer reviewed <laughs> spaces. And now they've published at least two books together. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> holy smoke, you know, this is all happening. But I do think we need to look at the individual so much more than often we do. We look at the average person, you know, how is this working for this average person? Yes. But none of us are that damn average person. Um, and that is what I discover more and more every day with my work. Everyone is so individual. You know, everyone has got their strength. You know, a lot of people have got strengths that you just, you know, you cover it. You're like, wow, I wish I could do that. And, of course, they all have their, you know, their things that they need to work on. That is what I love about it. I'm working with people with lots of different struggles and also skills and strengths. No average. I mean, not one of them. Yeah. Like, I guess with any... I, I'm always hesitant to talk kind of in diagnoses. I think they are mm. that made more important than they are, than they really mm. are in psychiatry. But if you're looking at people who hoard, there are themes, obviously, mm. because that's what groups people together. But that's mm. not to say you can say hoarders benefit from mm. X, you know, because I'm different to your clients to listeners mm. to yeah exactly and that I think is I think that's one of the unfortunate things with the kind of clinical psychology space it's very much that we want to use a manualized treatment that we can kind of follow the bouncing ball and just do you know what it suggests and I get it because you know if you're doing a study you want things mm. to be evidence-based. And mm. so that involves talking to 75 hoarders or 750 hoarders and doing a thing and proving it works or doesn't work. Mm. And I understand why that's important. I absolutely do. But as you say, you still can't then transfer that knowledge to every single person. Exactly. And also you might be out there working and something pops up that, no one's touched on <laughs> at all or they've you know maybe hinted to it but never de you know never delved into it and you think oh wow well this person has all these things you know that I need to work with like I had a call I haven't actually um, worked with this person but I got a call with someone with dissociative identity disorder and hoarding and um, I'm thinking wow okay how, you know, what would I do if I were to meet that person? How would I go about that? No one out there is, has dealt with the situation like that. Yeah. Yeah. That I know of, that I've spoken to. So, you know, you're out there trying to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals and you've got to use all the tools in your toolbox. Um, and I think the best place to start is to really 
and try and map out those things in the different parts of their life. You know, what are how what are their thoughts? You know, what context are they in? Are are they in all of those sorts of things? What are their circumstances? Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen in the clinical space. Yeah. So we've looked at the acceptance side of ACT. Looking at the commitment side of ACT, what kind of things might a hoarder be making a commitment to do? Mm. So in terms of commitment, this really plays back into a lot of the stuff we've talked about with regard to habits. You know, like this is where once you've sort of looked at what your values are, you can then break that down into, okay, well, what is my overall goal? What would I like to do within that value? And then it's breaking that down into tiny habits and saying, okay, well, it's really important for me to, you know, I really want to look after my health. So you've got your prongs there, you've got eating, exercise, whatever, and breaking that down. And that is what it's all about. It is taking those little steps and continuing to take take those steps towards or in the direction of values. And it's ACT doesn't kind of go, oh, goals are crap. You know, it doesn't sort of say that. It's not kind of like that. But it's more goals are great, but you tick them off and move on. So this is around have that value that you've really, that you've freely chosen. Consider what goals you might want to achieve. And then I just think the best thing for for people who are struggling with hoarding is those tiny habits daily. If we can get movement, it just builds it just it just builds on itself. And if we're doing our celebrating when we do tick off the box, it just kind of reinforces it, kind of gives you that little buzz. Oh yeah, this may be completely way off, but for some reason I'm thinking about a kid at my school and everybody was really frustrated with him because they were saying you're so clever, you could go to university, but you're not putting the work in. You're Mm. so clever, you could go to university, but you're not putting the work in. And nobody could understand why he wasn't putting the work in until somebody said to him one day, do you want to go to university? (laughs) And he said, no, I want to be a car mechanic. Mm. (laughs) And they were like, okay. So trying to push him to work to go to university had no effect at all it was his worst nightmare but Mm. saying well okay if you do like your physics that will really help you as a car mechanic and if Mm. you focus on your maths that will help you like you know putting people's bills together when you fix their car and suddenly he was an engaged student who you know was applying himself because for the first time in years somebody had said what are your values essentially what's your what do you want to do Mm. it's essentially what do you want to do who do you want to be oh that's so frustrating isn't it and that is what we what we do with education you know with with education we think oh well this is what oh everyone should go to university no (laughs) I don't agree if someone has that draw I mean he obviously had a, a real keen interest. Yeah. I'd love to know where he is now. I bet he did super well. Yeah, I bet he did. I bet he did. He's not someone I'm in touch with, but um it, you know, he was a clever kid. He could have absolutely but that doesn't mean university is the only option. And you can be mm. a clever car mechanic. There's no well, there's nothing unintelligent about being a car mechanic. Not at all. Yeah. So if somebody <laughs> says okay, a hoarder should commit to doing this thing and kind of imposes that, but that doesn't resonate with their values and their hopes and dreams, then, you know, you should tidy up because I don't like it. I don't care if you like it or not. I'm not going to tidy up. Whereas you tidy up so that your daughter brings her child around for the first time in years. That might be what resonates. Exactly. But if nobody says what's resonating for you, what, you know, Mm. then you're not going to get somebody to commit to that course of action because they've got no interest in it. No, exactly. And that is one of the core parts of that committed action is that, you know, it's got to be, it can't be some sort of pliant, something that you've just, 
you know, someone else wants you to do or yeah. that you, you know, you think that the local council wants you to do it or whatever. There's always something else that you can, you know, that the person's got as a driver to say, I want to be able to have the family around for Christmas lunch, you know, in two years' time or 12 months' time or whatever it is um, because I really miss having them and there's all these, you know, you can just hear it in people's voices. You can see it when they talk about it. You think, no, no, that's that's the one. That That's the one that will yeah. pull people through. And you're right, it cannot be actions that you think you should do. It can't be anything that you're shooting. It has to be something that you know, fits in with those values that you've really thought about, you know, take your time, take your time on that and really think it through. And that's a massive frustration for the people around hoarders. Mm. I I get that. It must be immensely frustrating on an ongoing basis that you can't convince that person to do something. Mm. But mm. I think what you're saying and thinking about the car mechanic guy Mm. is reinforcing to me which i which i already knew but it's kind of providing explanations as to why that pressure from other people while understandable is mostly useless yep yep because you haven't actually asked the person what do you want or you know it's always that people finally eventually turn around to that kid at school and say well what is it that you're actually wanting to do oh i want to be they can tell you straight up and you're like, oh, my God, how come I've just been telling you what to do and it hasn't worked? You know, light bulb moment. It's not going to work if you're – you need to be – this is super hard because often, um, you know, if you're the family member of that person who hoards, you're a child of that person who hoards, <laughs> there's so much trauma and and relationship um, dysfunction Yeah, that it's super, super difficult. But if the people who hoard can kind of understand that and and do some of their own underlying work to kind of say, well, what, you know, throw their hands up and say, I'm not going to keep going in the direction I'm going. What direction do I want to go in? Yeah. What am I at? Where am I? What are my values? What the heck? What is meaningful to me? And as the second you can say, well, these things are meaningful, then you've got kind of a path. Then everyone else can kind of come onto that path with you, uh, but without that, you're kind of rudderless. Really, you're kind of just sort of flapping about, not knowing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of a lot of people out there, that's exactly how they are living. It's that whole, you know, midlife crisis thing. Oh, you know, I've got everything that I've ever wanted, and I still feel empty and alone. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, I thought that. Having the corner office and the posh car would do it, mm. and I still feel. Shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I still come home from work and feel like crap, and drink whiskey, and you know, <laughs> it's just you know it, that's the stuff that it makes so much sense. The whole midlife crisis now, looking back on it, you know, as a as a mature person, I can see why <laughs> it happens because you do get to that point where you. You know, you sort of come to that peak and you think, what have I got all this for? <laughs> yeah. Giving back to your community, all those sorts of things. There's things we can do every day to find meaning. It's just a matter of working out, well, what is, you know, what is meaningful for me? So if people want to find you online, where can they do so? They can come on over to stuffology.com.au. Um, maybe they could go to Instagram at stuff underscore ology. Mm, Twitter, I think, is at stuff underscore ology. Yeah, or shoot me an email, jan at stuffology.com.au. I love hearing from people. I love hearing people's stories. Yeah, and sign up to the newsletter if you're interested. You can do that on the website. And I always recommend it because it's always good. Mm, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. You are a <laughs> font of wisdom. It is much appreciated. <laughs> I like being a font. See you soon. Do you have any burning questions you'd love me to answer? I'll get to the top tip in a second. But my first Q&A episode was really popular. 
So I'm going to be open to questions on a rolling basis. And then when I have enough, I'll make another episode answering them. Contact me on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or plain old email. All the links are on my website at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Ask me anything and I will do my best to answer it. Now, your top tip. So my top tip today is, it's kind of a quote. I saw a TikTok video or an Instagram reel or something ages ago, no idea who made it, but it was a guy talking, he'd been overhearing an argument on the bus between a couple and the woman said to her partner, I'd rather adjust to your absence than be continually frustrated by your presence. And that has stuck with me as quite powerful, really. I think with people and with stuff, we need to give some thought as to whether we would rather adjust to their absence or be continually frustrated by their presence. I'm continually frustrated by the presence of some stuff in my house, and maybe I just need to learn to adjust to the absence of that stuff instead. Okay, thank you for listening, and I will speak to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding podcast. You can find more online at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter at That Hoarder and on Facebook at Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder. To find out more about how you can support this podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk forward slash support and do subscribe to this podcast so you make sure you don't miss any future episodes.